Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to your next little lecture. This time we're going to speak about exploratory structure equation modeling. Um, and I'm going to give you some practical guidelines and a very non-technical tutorial on how to estimate it in M plus with our eSIM tool. It's going to make life super convenient for you. I'm very privileged today to um, be working with a very good friend of mine, uh, Leon De Beard. I always make the joke and say that uh, he's the brains and I'm the mouth of our outfit and together we make one functioning human being. So we kind of developed this tool together and also this presentation to kind of help you guys to estimate your very first <coughs> eSIM model. So <coughs> the, this whole presentation is basically based on a publication that will appear next year in January that you can already find online on ResearchGate, where we provided a step-by-step, -step, very non-technical, -pract uh, non, um, practical tutorial on eSIM. So this whole presentation is basically based on this and all the supplementary material can be found on ResearchGate if you just Google the title. Okay, so what we'll be doing today? Uh, we'll be doing three things. So if you're already very familiar with eSIM, um, you can just skip to the end where uh, we talk about either the guidelines or uh, the estimation part, right? So I'm going to start off by giving you guys a very, very, very gentle introduction into exploratory structure equation modeling. Then after that, um, we're going to show you the 10 steps you need in order to estimate it, right? So very practical guidelines, 10 things you need to consider uh, to, to estimate ESM. And then finally, we're going to go into M plus and we're going to estimate these things practically by utilizing a tool that we've created and that you can already access. Okay, so these are the three things that we'll be doing today. Um, so let's start off with a very, very, very gentle introduction to structure equation modeling, to exploratory structure equation modeling. So in order for us to understand this whole ESIM thing, we have to go way, 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 way back, right? Like to the, to the 1920s and 1940s, to classical, classical test theory. So the whole foundation of psychology is built on the fact that we want to be able to measure and predict uh, human behavior, right? That's fundamentally the, 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 the fundamental thing that we wanted to do. So we created various techniques and approaches in order to measure behavior, right? From observational techniques, think about like the Hawthorne studies, right through to intelligence tests, self-report measures, simulations, and all these types of things. But fundamentally, how we analyze, for example, these test results comes down to one of two approaches. Right, so how do we analyze data? How do we measure things? How do we see what we've measured is actually living up to or creating something bigger, a latent factor? So there were two techniques that psychologists really rely on. The first one, which you might know, is exploratory factor analysis. Now, EFA refers to like a, a set of statistical techniques that we use to help to identify or uncover the, the smallest number of relevant dimensions needed to explain the relation or covariance between a set of items, right? So it's really just a technique that we use to identify common factors in the data that helps to explain um, bigger factors, right? And how to explain the order and structure of um, items in a measuring instrument. So basically, it's a technique that we utilize to explore our data. So it's very data driven in a, in a sense to help us to come up with very nice clusters of items that measure very specific things. In EFAs, we kind of know that factors are to be freely estimated by our data. Right. And in this free estimation, anything goes basically. So we can we have cross loadings um, are permitted and all of these types of things, all with the main idea to help us to become up with a small, interpretable, meaningful factor. And you guys know a lot better than I do. There are various types of uh, EFA approaches and techniques, but there are basically a couple of issues with EFAs. Right. So first thing is we can't really control for things like method effects and common method bias. It's, it's impossible for us to do. Um, we can't use EF, an EFA model or 
approach or results or whatever in, in a larger, more complex analysis, right? It's impossible. Um, we also can't really compare the EFA results from one study with another study unless the factor loadings and things are pretty much exactly the same and we've got a similar population group or so on. So it's really, we, we can't do this. Um, and it's also very much data driven and not theory driven. So on the positive end, it helps to kind of figure out what these meaningful relationships are between, between items so we can create meaningful factors. But on the negative end, and we can't really do much within, within EFA by itself. So this then led to the creation of the second most popular technique in uh, psychological measure, measurement, which is confirmatory factor analysis. And this one you guys should already be very familiar with. So confirmatory factor analysis, unlike EFAs, are pretty much theory driven, right? So when we want to explore stuff in EFAs, we want to confirm things in CFAs. In EFAs, what does this instrument look like? I don't know, let's see. CFAs, I know exactly what this instrument looks like, how, which items lead to which factor, and now I want to confirm that on my data that I've just selected or just gathered, right? So it's very much theory based and it's very much very strongly informed um, by the original way in which um, the questionnaire was designed, for example. So, so here the focus really is on, unlike exploring the data, the, here the focus is on fitting our data, uh, fitting our model to the data that we have in order to see which type of CFI model, so which version, factorial version of the thing, of the instrument fits our data the best. Unlike in EFAs, in confirmatory factor analysis, we say that if we have 10 items, 5 items measures one factor, 5 items measures another factor, that these items cannot cross-load. They cannot interact with one another. So we constrain these cross-loadings to zero by creating very pure um, latent factors. But the problem with CFAs is that these models are usually very simplistic and when we have more complex models, for example, they don't really fit our data that well. So we have to do all sorts of modifications in order to get our data to fit our model, which is not really nice. Um, also, I think it's very idealistic to assume that everything that we measure, so every item that we measure, is a pure indicator of a factor. It's impossible. If I ask you um, the three questions about happiness, right? Um, how meaningful is your life? How much do you like uh, ice cream? Or are you overall satisfied with where you're at in your life at the moment? Um, theoretically, these three items measure up something larger like uh, life satisfaction or happiness for that matter, pleasure, meaning, and engagement. Um, but these things interact with one another, right? They're not in isolation and they can also be factors by themselves. So it's not really cool to assume that everything that we measure are pure factors and that they are 100% um, loading 100% all the time on the same things. Otherwise, we would have, we, we would have 100% data model fit on everything that we do, and that's not the case. Okay. Also, in multidimensional mo models, it's also really naive to think that no cross function or cross interaction between items is, um, yeah, it, it doesn't happen. Why? Because one method effect, unfortunately, because if we add all of the questions together, we know people respond in a certain way and you're influenced to answer a next question based on the previous question that you've answered. So methodologically, there is an issue, but practically there's also an interaction between things. So think about something like pleasure, meaning and engagement as functions of happiness. There are three different factors, right? But they do interact with one another because otherwise, how would I know I'm happy if I'm not engaged in something that, um, that I find meaningful, right? So there is in multidimensional models, there is some form of interaction, which CFIs don't necessarily always capture. Um, what's also a big limitation with um, CFAs is that we kind of consistently have to balance between measurement quality and model data fit, right? So we really focus on, with, for example, in structural equation modeling, we go and we apply our data and all of a sudden we find that our model doesn't fit very well. But our instrument is really good. It shows very high levels of measurement quality, so extremely good factor loadings, high levels of reliability, blah, 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 but then it pro provides crappy model fit. So then we try to manage model fit at the expense of measurement quality. There's a whole bunch of um, simulation studies. You can Google Daniel McNash. Um, they did a whole bunch of simulation studies to kind of show that 
instruments with excellent measurement quality, really good instruments, usually produce very shitty um, model fit statistics. So that is another thing that is a problem with CFIs. So we usually get also in practice um, very crappy model fit and multi-dimensional measures. So, and a thing that I have a little bit of an issue about is that very rarely um, our CFI models are aligned to the theoretical understanding of a construct. So we'll speak about mental health, the mental health continuum later, where mental health is seen as on a function of languishing to flourishing, right? Um, and that uh, mental health is a dynamic interaction between emotional, psychological, and social well-being. But no, it's measured as three categories. It's measured as three different things clustered into three categories. And that's not a continuum. You're not measuring uh, a dynamic interaction between factors, right? So you're measuring something that's not aligned to your theoretical concept. And that's another major limitation of the CFAs. So how do we address this? Well, Morin and Marsh had a very nice idea. They came up with this whole concept about exploratory structure equation modeling. Now, exploratory structure equation modeling, or ESIM, was really developed to incorporate the best of both worlds, of both EFAs, right, so and, other, and CFAs. So looking at EFAs, for example, it helps us to do more predictive relationships between factors. It helps us to adjust for measurement error, can produce, um, helps us to manage method effects. We can correlate uniqueness, create more bifactors, blah, 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 do very complex analysis. And the flexibility of EAs, allowing us to do, uh, to have cross loadings, right? So all of these things together, um, so combining the best of CFAs and EFAs, we get ESIM. Now, ESIM is basically, a, is fundamentally a confirmatory technique. So it's very much a priori driven, although Marsh indicates that you can utilize ESIM for exploratory purposes, but that's a, that's a whole different, um, a whole different video. But anyway, seeing that ESIM is a confirmatory technique, um, it's important for us to understand what the fundamental principles here are, um, which through like um, a target rotation, it helps to make our, um, it makes it possible to model data in a confirmatory way by allowing us to have cross loadings. So in other words, ESAM helps us to incorporate CFAs and EFAs, right? By helping us to create an a priori structure of something, but it allows us to have cross loadings between different items. So in this example, you'll see perseverance and, and interest, right? It's made up of 10 items. In a traditional CFA, these things would be um, these five items would only load on perseverance and these five items only load on interest. But we know that these things interact with one another. So we allow for cross loadings to take place, but not fully. This is important. Cross loadings are permitted, but they are constrained to be as close to zero as possible. Okay, so that's really important here. Um, well, where was I? Oh, yeah. um, because this is a fundamentally a confirmatory technique, so it utilizes confirmatory factor analysis, so ESIM is also nested in um, a CFI approach, we can use normal model fit statistics and normal approaches to kind of estimate and compare ESIM models. And that is quite a benefit. So it's, it seems new, but at least it's not new in totality, right? So at least that's a, a major benefit for you as the novice. Um, but again, seeing that this, but seeing that this thing also capitalizes on, you know, the whole thing about exploratory factor analysis, it does imply that the rotation that you use, like you would do in um, EFAs, plays a major role here. So you know, if there's like two, uh, if there's two factors that we're measuring and they're shared variance in a normal EFA, we would use something like a Geoman or a direct Oblomen rotation. Or if the things are not <clears throat> related, we would use something like Verimax, right? So the rotation. Um, plays, impo plays an important role in EFAs to help us to cluster these relationships between the items so we can create these higher order factors, right? So <clears throat> the same principle applies in, uh, e in ESIM. So we have to make sure that we are very well and um, very clear with regards to the type of rotation that we use because the rotation that we use will influence our results. And there are basically three types of rotations that we can use in ESIM. The one is Geoman rotations, right? And this is where we use it more for more exploratory types of studies, where we have some idea of how the factors relate, but we want to have a little bit more flexibility in terms of our estimation process. <clears throat> um, targeted rotation is more important in, um, 
target rotation is more important in structure equation modeling because we are targeting um, this factor to be made up of these items. So this factor, um, we call these like target item loadings. So item 1 to 12 here is targeted to be part of this factor, but we allow for cross loadings onto other factors. So target rotation is important. Um, in bifactor ESA models, which we I made a video about bifactors earlier, which you can also see, but in bifactor models, we have to constrain all relationships and things to be zero. And here we use an orthogonal, I said it previously wrong, orthogonal um, rotation where we constrain all of the things, um, the relationships between factors to be zero. But I'll explain this in a minute. So this is basically what ESIM is. Fundamentally, ESIM is a combination of the best of EFAs and the best of CFAs in a whole new technique. The fundamental principle is that we allow for cross loadings between factors, but they should be constrained to be as close to zero as possible. So what are the advantages then of these different types of ESIM models? One, it's a lot more rigorous, robust and flexible than EFAs and uh, CFAs. And provides us with uh, better estimations, better um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, par uh, parameter estimates, and, and these types of things. And it's a lot more flexible to use. You will also see later that <clears throat> it also helps us to get better, um, de better data model fit, right, and better measurement quality. It can also help us to simultaneously estimate CFAs and EFAs in the same model, right? That's kind of nice. It helps also to um, estimate less restrictive measurement models that helps produce better fit. So because we allow for these cross loadings, allow for interaction between different things, um, in, it helps us to inflate our model fit statistics, right? Um, this is important for the last point, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, by utilizing eSIM, it also helps us to have more realistic or less biased uh, latent factor correlations. Because in CFAs, we constrain every factor right? We constrain them to be unique and their own little thing, even though they're not. Um, and because of this, the relationship between this factor and something else can be a lot bigger than what it would be normally, because there is some variance that leaks. So think about this factor as like a big balloon with lots of holes in it, right? So there's a lot of variance getting lost or going to other things, right? Um, as we yeah, as we naturally move. But now we kind of seal that balloon and now all of the pressure, we open just one little point at the top. So all of that pressure then goes onto one other factor. And that's not realistic. Okay, so it's important to understand that normal CFIs really produces biased results and inflated uh, correlations and regressions. So as I mentioned earlier, ESEMs are also a lot more aligned to the theoretical conceptualization of constructs. And I'll show you two examples about grit and mental health in a minute. But for example, in <clears throat> mental health, we say that uh, mental health is a function of emotional, psychological, and social well-being, and it's on a continuum, right? It's measured as categories, but it's conceptualized as a continuum. So by measuring it as eSIM, by allowing for cross learnings between different factors, we are actually creating a continuum, and we are creating this dynamic interaction between the factors required for us to move on this continuum. So it's a lot more aligned to this theoretical conceptualization of a, of a concept. And then finally, something that we kind of found recently was that ESIM also compensates for wording effects and differences in uh, when we measure the same construct in different cultures. So we measure, for example, grit in uh, three different cultures in Europe or, or nations in Europe, in uh, the US and in Hong Kong, right? And we found that normal CFI models just don't work, right? And we couldn't find invariance between, so they fit and etc. but they, we couldn't find invariance between the different nations on normal CFI models because it's too restrictive because people see this grid factor as something different, right? So by allowing for these cross loadings, we could get invariance between the different nations, which means we can make actual comparisons between them because this cross loadings, right? compensates for how me as a Westerner now um, interpret something and you perhaps as someone from a collectivistic culture, right? So it compensates for these differences in how we see items and therefore it makes it more robust and means we can make comparisons between things a lot easier. So really, really, really cool technique. <clears throat> the problem, however, 
is that a normal ESAM model, unfortunately, you can't really easily estimate more complex things like structural models or multi-level analysis or whatever. So a normal ESAM like this at the bottom or this grid factor uh, or this um, bifactor ESAM model at the top, you can't really use this in more complex models. We can't really estimate mediation then either because we can't because ESIM is not open to generate the confidence intervals we require in order to kind of see if mediation actually takes place. Um, we can't estimate higher order factors very easily with um, with normal ESIM models. So it's very difficult with normal ESIM model to create like a second order factor model, right? Um, we can't test for partial invariance. We can't re lift restrictions if, when, and where. It makes it very difficult. Um, we can also not model simultaneous sets of factors. So if you want to do ESIM and you've got three factors, so you've got person environment fit and you've got grit and you've got performance, you have to do an ESIM on each one of these things uh, separately and then put them together on, a, on the same page later to uh, do correlations or, or whatever. That's you, so you can't really do this, uh, what you would normally do in a measurement model by putting everything on the same page and kind of see how these things interact. So these different sets is difficult because everything is always related to everything. Um, and usually, unlike CFAs, our ESMs are usually not very parsimonious, which in effect causes a lot of convergence problems. So your question now is, okay, so I've taught you all of these good things about it, but I can't actually use it above and beyond just confirming a factor model. Right? Yeah, it's pretty shitty. I'm so sorry. ESIM is useless. Kidding, kidding. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this video. Um, so these factors can then be addressed by two new approaches, also by Morin and uh, Marsh. Marsh created something called set ESIM, which I'll speak about in a moment, and Morin created something called ESIM within CFA. And these two approaches allows us to do more complex analyses, to utilize ESIM in a more traditional way, like you would normally do in any other type of CFA type of model. So ESIM within CFA basically assumes that the resulting measurement structure of an, an instrument would remain relatively stable if it was transformed into a CFA model. So it says that if we take this model right and do something to it which i don't want to spoil yet but if we transform this into a cfa the structure of things should stay relatively the same okay so within this framework what we would call like a first order ESM model like this one we then try to we then kind of re-express it as a cfa model by utilizing the unstandardized factor loadings from our m plus output as the starting values for a cfa model right does that make sense? So we constrain, so we have our, we run this ESA model on this factor, we get the results for all of these little interactions. Then we take the unstandardized results from this and we constrain each factor of a CFA model to be equal to that unstandardized value. So in other words, the starting values of each factor loading will be the same uh, for in the CFA model, the re-expressed CFA model, will then be the same for uh, as the uh, ESA model. And these two things should produce exactly the same results, right? So basically, what we what we then do in, in general is that we re-express this model, this ESM model, as a CFA model. So look, Daddy, I am officially a CFA now. So we take all of these loadings, like I've mentioned. So if this one was 0.8, 0.7, 0.6, 0.2, and 0.1, then we constrain this item to say perseverance by item 1 at 0 0.8. Item 6 at 0 0.6, item 9 at 0 0.5, so to be exactly the same as this. That way, our CFA model now fully represents, or our ESM within CFA model, fully represents the findings of our ESM. And now we can use this to do a lot more powerful things. Okay, so like I've mentioned, um, now we can kind of do more complex things like creating a higher order factor. So we utilize ESIM within CFA, right, to create a higher order factor of grid, so a second order factor of it. Or we can use it as to predict 
another factor like happiness or we can do latent growth modeling oh sorry um, so we can now estimate more complex orientated uh, models. We can also estimate partial mediation, for example, because this, by expressing it now as a CFA model, we technically can generate confidence intervals because it's just normal CFA now in practice. Um, what else did I forget to say? Oh yeah. Also, uh, in the original study, more and them kind of also showed that ESM, the ESM within CFA solution could um, also be used to show how factors change over time. So doing like more latent growth modeling stuff and also doing like um, latent change analysis. So we can basically use um, the findings of an ESA model, confirm it, uh, transform it or re-express it as a CFA model. And now we can do normal analyses. So anything that your, your imagination can go on, go wild on, mediation, moderation, mediated medi moderation, latent growth model, autoregressive modeling, latent class, latent profile analysis, all of these things are now possible because of um, this whole ESIM within CFA approach. Okay, um, I'll explain all of this a little bit later in, in uh, a bit more detail. So don't worry too much about it. The only problem that we have with ESIM within CFA is that we can't really estimate all of these different ESIM models at the same time. So we can't have happiness, grit, and performance on the same M plus page because all of the factors would relate to each other. But theoretically, these these items on performance is not related to happiness, for example, right? So why would we then allow for um, these cross learnings to take place? So that would undermine the theoretical integrity um, of the of the construct. So. This is where set ESIM comes in, and this is not something that we will practically show you later, but just important to know. So set ESIM basically allows us to model um, two or more sets, uh, distinct sets of uh, constructs within the CFA framework, where cross loadings are allowed between factors that they're supposed to be related to and constricted to zero for factors that it's not related to. Um, these types of sets could easily reflect um, the same construct um, at different intervals in a longitudinal study. So for example, you can correlate uh, perseverance uh, with perseverance over time, or it can be correlated with different factors in a cross-sectional study, for example. So ESM, uh, set ESIM basically allows us to then simultaneously estimate um, all of these factors at the same time to help us to find an optimal balance between like CFAs and ESMs um, in respect of parsonomy and data model fit. So to, um, to make this very practical, um, the set ESIM helps us to kind of what we can maintain the structural or theoretical integrity of our, uh, of our factor by saying that we want to look at the relationship eventually between grit, the grit factors, perseverance and consistency of interest, and the hobbies that I like. Because we know, practically speaking, that my hobbies are very much aligned to my interests. So it makes sense. It's a different factor. It's not something that's attached to grit, these two factors. It's something totally different, a different measure, right? But we know, theoretically speaking, that my hobbies, and, right, the things that I like doing for fun, um, is strongly related to my interests, but not so much to perseverance, right? So therefore, I can allow, for, uh, in my set ESM model, for the, the items on... Um, uh, on hobbies to cross load with items on um, consistency of interest, but constrained to not load on perseverance. So these two factors can then relate as separate things from one another. So cross loading is being permitted between those items, but constrained for this last factor. And this is what, what makes set ESIM so awesome. So because of set ESIM, we can then kind of put all of these things on the same page and find the optimal solution between all of our um, factors. Okay, so like I've, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. So like I've mentioned, um, in this case, all of these items work together. So grit is a function of perseverance and interest. And these factors are all permitted to load and cross load in uh, this ESIM or in a normal ESIM model. And when we want to look at the hobby stuff because of that relationship, the items from hobbies and the items of interest can cross load. So, but they're not allowed to load on perseverance, right? So in effect, we can estimate this in totality. So that's kind of awesome, right?
So what type of models can we then kind of estimate in ESAM? So I'm going to focus specifically on like factorial models. And because of this uh, HESAM or H, this ESAM within CFA approach, we can now estimate any type of factorial model that your imagination can dream of. We can estimate um, bifactor models, we can estimate higher order factors and normal first order factorial, uh, factorial models. Okay, so that is it for the first part. So now that we know what ESAM is and what its function are and what we can do with it, how do we go uh, about it? So we created, uh, we wrote a paper and looked at and created guidelines, very specific guidelines that you can use to help you from the beginning of your uh, ESAM journey right through to the end, right? So step by step, we've got 10 steps that you can go through in order for you to do an actual ESIM analysis, right? So we've basically, in our paper, we write that there are three phases of things that you need to take in consideration. We have the planning phase, right? Which is a combination of making sure that you know exactly what it is that you're going to measure and plan for the appropriate sample size. So we plan appropriately for it. We then have the data collection slash cleaning slash preparation um, section where we kind of have to focus on making sure that we have, that our data set is clean, that everything is right and in order, and that we're utilizing the right software and rotation and procedure and etc. And the last part is the actual data analysis part where we go through from how do we select the best fitting model right through to uh, reporting um, uh, our best fitting models items. So there's three phases. The first thing is the planning phase. The second thing is the um, data preparation phase. And the last part is the execution slash data analysis phase. And I'll go through all of these things um, in a bit more detail. But we're drawing here really much from uh, CFAs, right? So we're drawing from the best practice guidelines in confirmatory factor analysis and SEM, where the uh, the process is make sure that you have a good model, have the appropriate sample size, make sure that your data is clean and normally distributed, you indicate which is the most appropriate software to use, indicate the type of criteria that you're going to use to kind of evaluate the models, estimate and report the different models, compare them to find the best. So this is here, um, then report the best fitting model and then kind of looking at um, to kind of further discriminate looking at the differences between ESM and CFA, for example, through um, looking at their factorial correlations. And then based on that, report your item level parameters for the best fitting model. And then you can go do more advanced things like ESM and ESM within CFA and whatever. And I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so the first part is quite easy. Um, the, the planning phase is basically comprised out of two things. First thing, developing a very clear theoretical model and plan for the appropriate sample size. Here it's really important for us to briefly discuss the various types in the first phase, the various types of theoretical, theoretically informed CFA models that we're expecting to come from the data, right? So we have an instrument and we know this instrument is shown to have certain theoretical um, permutations. So it's important to discuss these and be very clear with regards to this from the beginning. If factors within a CFA model are conceptually related, then there's also an argument for us then to kind of utilize uh, ESAM. So if you've got uh, like uh, three totally different factors. Like I like to, uh, I like relationships, but I also like um, driving my car fast versus I like to draw. These are three. These are things that are not related to each other, uh, but they could come up to something higher than uh, a high order factor like hobbies or whatever. But they're not really related to each other. So a very max rotation, um, and because of this there's no need for an ESIM. So the first thing is that we have to make sure that our model, our um, CFI models are clearly defined. If these are multidimensional factors and that they are related to one another, right? Then we have a clear case for ESIM. So also it's important to know, like when we validate uh, psychometric instruments, we have to present also very clear like hypotheses with regards to um, our factorial structure. Right, and we always give like alternatives in our hypotheses or whatever. We say, oh, we think it's going to be a first order, or a second order factor, or whatever. Um, so, if we have a very clear indication of these uh, CFA models, we can also prevent a very nice justification for these uh, ESM models. Um, so, let me quickly show you. So, for if we utilize the concept of grit, which is basically um, an indicator of 
high levels of interest, high levels of passion and perseverance, so being very gritty uh, for your long-term goals. We know that from the grit O scale, from a CFA perspective, there are at least four different models that's available. We can do a unidimensional model where grit is one factor. We know that it can be like a correlated first order factorial model with two first order factors made of perseverance and um, interest. We also know that it can be a higher, a second order factor model. This is now CFAs, right? Where grit is a function of interest and perseverance. And we also know that it can be a bifactor model where we measure overall general grit as a function of these different items. And then when we control for grit, whatever is left, the variance that's left makes up perseverance and interest, right? So this is also the four different uh, CFA models that the grid scale can show. But we also know, given that these things are related conceptually, um, and it has at least been tested before, we know that we can also estimate ESA models. So we can estimate a second order, a uh, first order, correlated uh, ESA model, which is made up of these eight items, where consistency of interest and perseverance of effort are independent factors, and they've got target loadings on their target items, but where cross loadings with other items on the other factor is permitted, but constrained to be as close to zero as possible. We can then also estimate uh, a bifactor ESA model, where exactly the same process, where um, we have a general factor of grit, which is a function, a direct function of all of the, the items, right? Um, and we have two target or two specific factors with target loadings onto their a priori factorial structure, but we allow for cross loadings to other factors to be as close to zero as possible and no correlation, no covariance between the first order factors. Okay, and then through the ESM within CFA approach, right, we can then re-specify these factors as um, a CFA model, and then we can specify uh, a higher order um, factorial model of grit. But this is more complex, and this is also where our tool comes in, which I'll explain to you guys later. So we have to kind of then re-specify these things as a CFA model, um, create a higher order factor structure, and then do the same thing we would normally do, right? To constrain that variance of the grit factor to one, and etc., etc. So the normal stuff. Okay. So that's the first step, making sure that we've got a clear theoretical model. Now, it's really important to also note that within ESEM, we have to estimate and specify a large number of, um, we have to, a large number of parameters need to be estimated. Therefore, we need a large enough sample and you need to plan for this stuff in the beginning. And so you can do, um, like utilize various forms of, uh, power estimation or sample size estimation techniques, like the non-centrality parameter, like what, uh, the, that's a Torres Saris 1985 approach where we kind of look at what's the probability of us getting misfit, or we can utilize like the, um, the what's it? Oh, I forgot the name now, McDonald, I think, or Mac, McCullinan, there we go. The McCullinan approach, which is focused on what's the likelihood of us getting a good remisa. So these are things we can also utilize the, or the rules of thumb, um, from Wolf and them, where they basically said you um, can have like for every item in whatever you need 10 people per item per construct in your measurement model, you can also use that. Um, but the most appropriate way is to run Monte Carlo simulations to really figure out what the exact number is that you need for your specific data. Um, and there's a nice article by Wolf et al. 2013 that shows you in N plus how to do this. Okay, so that is the planning phase getting your model right, making sure you know what you're going to estimate, plan for the appropriate sample size. Then we have to get, then we go and we get our data, we distribute it to everybody, and we get a large amount of amazing data back, right? Now we have to make sure that we prepare the data appropriately. And this is the data preparation phase. And this is also combined out of two things. One thing is the data set needs to be screen cleaned and prepared for further analysis. And we have to, um, we have to figure out what the most appropriate software is for our estimation. We have to indicate what our estimation method is, so the estimate that we're going to use, what rotation we're going to use, and what the procedure is that we're going to follow in our analysis, right? So this is our planning phase. So first, if we look at the whole data cleaning, screening, and preparation thing, this is standard practice, I think, for everybody, so I'm not going to do a full lecture on this, but there are four th three things we have to take in consideration. How are we going to manage missing values? Are we going to use FIML, which is like the default in M+, um, are we going to remove full cases, whatever? 
um, I'll be going to um, like simulate responses or whatever, but you have to figure out what you're going to do with missing values and report it. Also indicate it's not so much of a problem nowadays, but you have to also indicate how you're going to manage outliers. So if you've got a, not a very normally distributed model, which is now going to be in the next step, um, you can compensate for this by utilizing another estimator, for example. So instead of using maximum likelihood ML, you can utilize MLR, for example. But it's important to indicate how you're going to manage outliers. And then finally, always ensure that you do data quality checks. Right? And there are various techniques that you can use by looking at the response time, on uh, looking what the average response time is, and then calculating um, the, the average distance between responses, and then seeing how people kind of um, differ from this. Also looking at response patterns in data, if people just going one, 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 two, 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 three, two, 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 three, these things need to be removed. So make sure that you also ensure that you do implement some other form of um, data quality checks. What's also then important, the second step, is to make sure that we clearly specify how we're going to approach our, um, our analysis. Now, there are two programs that could possibly do um, ESEM. It's both M plus and R, but R only implemented in a very rudimentary fashion. Leon, that helped me with this presentation, um, he's creating currently a, a R package for ESEM. So hopefully he will be able to report on that later. But for now, ESEM is fully integrated into M plus, and that's the preferred um, approach. You have to indicate which estimation method you're going to use. So you can use normal maximum likelihood, which is the default in M plus, but Morin indicates that you should use MLR robust measures from the beginning, or if you use categorical data, uh, WLSMV as the estimator. The problem just is with these two estimators is that you can't directly compare models with one another when you compare like a normal chi-square difference test and etc. You have to then use stuff like the satora bentler method or whatever to compare chi-square. So if your data is normally distributed and it runs, stick with ML, it's a lot easier, but Mora indicates that from the beginning you should use MLR. And then what's really important, um, really important is that you have to specify what type of rotation method you're going to use. Like I've mentioned before, there are three. Geoman with an, um, with an epsilon of 5, or 0 0.5, is important if you want to do more exploratory stuff. We use a target rotation consistently in general for everything. So if you're not going to do some exploratory, exploratory structure equation modeling, right, um, use a target rotation from the beginning. And if you're going to utilize or test for bifactor ESEMs, then use uh, a target orthogonal. I keep saying that word bad. Orthogonal rotation. Okay. So it's important to, to mention these types of things. So to summarize, indicate how you're going to manage your missing data, data quality checks, and remove outliers or figure out how you're going to use, um, compensate for them. Make sure that you indicate what software package you're going to use. Select the appropriate sample uh, estimator ML for normal distribution, MLR robust if this data is not normally distributed, or WSLV for categorical, and indicate your rotation, which can be Geoman with an epsilon of 5, target rotation, or orthogonal. Okay, so now we've got the planning phase done, we've got the data management stuff done, now we get to the fun stuff, the data analysis part. Now the data analysis basically um, you will follow exactly the same steps that you would do um, for a normal CFA, right? We provide the criteria that's necessary on how to evaluate different models based on measurement quality and uh, model fit statistics. That's important for us. We first estimate uh, and report normal CFA models. This is really important because we want to compare CFAs to ESIMs um, from the beginning. So you first estimate all of your CFAs. Then you estimate and report all of your ESEM models like you would normally do with model fit statistics. Then you compare the two with one another to figure out which one is the best. Um, and then based on this, you then retain your best fitting one or two or three models. You can further discriminate by them in the next step by reporting the factorial correlations. So you want the, the factor with a, the relationship between the first order factors or whatever is the smallest, right? And then once this is done, you can then report on the item level parameters of your instrument. And if this is done, you can do more complex analysis like indicate criterion validity or whatever um, by transforming your model into uh, ESM within CFA model, for example. Okay, make sense? So far, you have to be with me. 
I hope you are. Uh, if not, just ask me questions. Um, okay. So the first step, like I said, is that we have to kind of figure out how we're going to discriminate against models. What criteria are we going to use? So um, we use two things, one model fit and two measurement quality indicators. So um, model fit indicators, you should be very well versed with already. We look at chi-square um, and we really want a non-significant chi-square value. Um, and of course, in the perfect world, we want a chi-square of zero because chi-square is an indicator of model misfit. Right? So the larger the chi-square, if it's significant, then it, it means that yeah, we have an issue. But unfortunately, as you know, we are also penalized for both um, sample size and model complexity. So it's not really that good of a measure. We just report it nowadays for transparency, but it's not really an indicator that um, we, we technically use uh, anymore, but it's an important thing to, to kind of measure. Then we also have RMCA and SRMR. You kind of know that we want it to be, both of these things to be as close to zero as possible. Um, where for RMCA, uh, anything below eight is acceptable, but between six and eight is marginal and between zero and five, uh, 0 0.1 and five is excellent. We also want this to be non-significant, right? And we don't want that confidence interval range to include zero because then we have a, a, an issue. Um, in a recent study, the cost have also showed that the different models that you compare, the confidence interval range um, shouldn't overlap too much between different models. Um, when we do comparisons, for example, between different models, like in variance testing and things, um, there are some criteria that set rules of thumb, but don't use these things as like a, a set value. But if things, models uh, differ, like bigger than 0 0.15, 0 .0 then uh, we can retain the, the better model but don't uh, hit too much hard on this specific item. Same thing with SRMR, we want it to be as close to zero as possible, so similar criteria, unfortunately, you can't have a significant one. So it needs to be smaller than 0 0.8, um, but preferably between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. So in terms of incremental fit in the ICs, yeah, um, we want CFI and TLI to be bigger than 0 0.9, but yeah, again, so you get penalized for sample size and you get penalized for um, for model complexity on, C, uh, on CFI. So uh, then we can use kind of like TLI because it's not so um, robust. Sorry, I said that wrong. I said, sorry, please forget that. I, I was already jumping to the next one. We For CLI, we do not get penalized for um, sample size and for model complexity, but for TLI, we do get um, compensated. Uh, lost my, my turn of thought now. We do get penalized for model complexity. The more, model, the more complex the model, the more likely you are to get a good um, TLI, unfortunately, even if it's a crappy model. Okay, And then we just use AIC, BIC, and these values uh, for comparative reasons to kind of compare and discriminate against our models. So we don't use just one criteria. We have to use a combination of all of the criteria. And the more criteria that's met by each model, the more likely you are to um, have a good data model fit. Uh, and it's more likely that you have to retain that specific one. Okay, in terms of measurement quality, um, it's always important to first look at uh, data model fit, right? Standard CFA stuff. See if your model fits the data, then determine which model is the, the best data, uh, which model fits the data the best. We then kind of have to have some indicator of what is the minimum value for our standardized factor loadings. So um, we want to have a minimum value of at least 0.35. In bifactor models, we're less concerned with significance, um, but we're more, we're more worried about um, a well-defined general and specific factor. So the majority of the items need to be kind of associated with one another and um, yeah, these types of things. I'll explain that in a moment when we get to the practical stuff. Um, all the item loadings in CFAs, of course, need to load significantly and also target items on target factors in ESM need to load significantly. Um, residual variances or item uniqueness needs to be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, the lower the better of course. Um, and we kind of indicate um, for ESM specifically indicators of reliability and we use McDonald's Omega, right? Do not use high RQL Omega, do not use specific Omega for um, specific factors, etc. just use overall Omega because unfortunately at the moment there's no way for us to estimate full reliability for an ESM model because we don't know how to incorporate the cross-loadings yet. 
So this is one of the, the criticisms. So just use overall omega as a thing. And then finally, we have to kind of consider or, or indicate what is our tolerance for cross-loadings. So what is the, the range that we would expect for a cross-loading to occur without it becoming an issue? So we can specify this usually as like below 0 0.3 or below 0 0.2 or whatever. Um, so, but we have to indicate that before. Make sense? Okay, now we have to find the criteria. Now it's the easy stuff. It's estimating each factorial model, boom, 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 um, and comparing them with one another. So estimate all of your CFA models, tabulate your results and tabulate your ESIM results, and then compare all of these things together to come up with the best fitting model for your data. Okay. But there are some criteria that you have to take consideration when you want to use the eSIM thing. So as I mentioned before, we compare models based on the goodness of fit criteria and the measurement quality stuff. More indicates that there are six things that we need to take into consideration here to, to justify the use uh, of or, the or to retain the eSIM model and eSIM model. The eSIM model should, of course, like with any other CFI approach, should ideally show better data model fit than any of the other um, CFI models. If the factor correlations, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, for the eSIM model are then also smaller than the CFI model, then we know that the eSIM model should be retained because there's better discrimination between the, the specific factors. Um, for correlated factorial models, so like in the, the case of GRIT, for example, the ESM model should show reduced factor correlations. And the ESM model should also show small to medium cross-loadings. Remember, we have to predefine our, um, our criteria or tolerance for it, but it needs to be small to medium. Um, should we have larger cross-loadings, so 0 0.3 upwards on different factors, then there should be a very theoretical, theory, a very good theoretical explanation for this. So, for example, in the mental health continuum, there's an item on the psychological well-being scale that measures positive relationships, but it also shows a very strong relationship with some of the concepts on social well-being. It makes sense: positive relationships, social well-being, right? So there is a strong theoretical argument for it, but you have to provide a clear indication why. Um, yeah, and if there is no indication there, then perhaps there might be something with regards to wor a wording effect or some logic that you can use to kind of uh, explain it. Uh, the fourth thing that you need to kind of take into consideration is that um, the estimated factors within the ESM model should be really well defined. So in other words, good factor loadings, significant loadings, good uh, factorial correlations, uh, and etc. So it needs to be really well defined. In the bifactor model, we want relatively good, well, uh, relatively well-defined specific and general factors. But each one of your fa your um, ESIM latent factors need to meet all of the criteria for you to be able to retain it, right? So if there's even a couple of items that are non-significant or whatever, but the CFA model shows that they are significant, then you retain the more parsonomous CFA model. Okay. Uh, what was the other factor? Okay. So another thing that's important that um, to consider is that if there are multiple of these um, large cross loadings between different factors, then we have an indication that there might be um, a bifactor present. So if you think there's a bifactor model present, there's a couple of additional things you kind of need to think of, need to take into consideration. The first thing is that the model should then, of course, show better data fit than any of the other CFA and ESIM models. So you specify the bifactor model, but it needs to be a better fit than the ESIM and the CFA models. There should be a very well-defined uh, or a relatively well-defined G factor with all of the items loading significant onto the thing. There might be one or two that's not, but then there needs to be a reason um, for it. And you need to have relatively well-defined uh, S factors, so specific factors, where some items might not necessarily load significantly, but at least the target items do load how they are supposed to load. Um, for bifactor models, the model fit should not be the only indicator that you use to kind of um, base your decision on retaining it, right? You should always inspect the parameter estimates uh, before making your final decision. Okay, it's really important because bifactor models, especially bifactor ESIM models, do give some weird results sometimes. It might fit the data better, but all of a sudden you have a negative relationship between happiness and performance, but in the CFI model there's a positive relationship, right? So it's always important to kind of also look at the parameter estimates um, before you make a decision on retaining the bifactor or not. Okay, so now we've compared the CFAs and the ESIMs and we found our best fitting model for our data, right? So now, just to kind of, we found like, let's say we found a 
three-factor eSIM and a three-factor CFI model. These are the two ones that are like very close to one another. So how do we discriminate? The first thing is we report on the factorial correlations. Like I've mentioned, for the final retained measurement models, the factorial correlations should be reported. Uh, unfortunately, you can't correlate the factors for a bifactor model. You can force it, right? Um, but then you're actually measuring something else, but you can't do it technically for um, a bifactor model. So what we know from classical test theory, the, the smaller the correlation between the different factors for the different models, the better discrimination between these factors are. So we want a small, the, the, the model with the smallest correlation between your two um, specific factors. And that model will then be uh, retained for further analysis. Okay. Um, after this, we can then um, report on the best fitting model. We then report the basic stuff um, like the measurement quality stuff, like the standard rice factor loadings, the item level residual variances, and etc. also indicate uh, was the, the, the thing reliable or not, or etc. So standard item level type of stuff that we have to report. Okay, um, and like I've mentioned, um, we can use either Omega, McDonald's Omega, or Composite Reliability for, um, for these ESA models. Okay, does it make sense? And then once we have a best fitting model, we can then transform this, take that model, and transform it into an ESIM within CFA model, and then whammo, whammo, jammo, we have, we can do anything we want, or well, almost anything. We can do more complex analysis. And I'll show you guys how to do that um, a little bit more practically later. Okay, so we are now, sorry for the long thing, we are now going into the practical part. So I would say take a quick five minute break, um, and then we're gonna go into the practical stuff. The supplementary material that we will use for the practical stuff is uh, on ResearchGate, or you can just Google, by the time you watch this, the paper will already be published. So you can just Google the title and the supplementary material will be there with the data and the examples and taxes and etc. Okay, so in this section, we're gonna talk about how do we estimate uh, an ESM model. I'm gonna show you how to do this practically and how to use our online tool. So we're going to use um, the data obtained from the mental health continuum, which is a very popular um, instrument within positive psychology and it measures mental health as a function of three things feeling good functioning well and fitting in so emotional well-being psychological well-being and social well-being emotional well-being having the capability or the to manage daily up and down so there's a balance between uh, positive and negative effect and you feel overall happy with your life psychological well-being i've got the necessary capabilities inside of me in order to manage daily hassles social well-being i have the capabilities and the experience to have good and positive relationships i uh, fit in with my society i contribute to something minimal and etc okay so the instrument measures well-being or mental health as a function of emotional psychological and social well-being so, can you remember what step one was in our process? We have to come up with different models that we want to test. Okay? And remember, like I mentioned before, Corey Keyes, who created the instrument, said that mental health is a function of a dynamic interaction between these different factors and that these things are on a continuum from languishing to flourishing. Right? So, Theory tells us that we can estimate at least six different types of models, and I'll show you what they look like now. A unidimensional model, um, a three-factor model, a hierarchical model, bifactor, and then ESIM models, right? So this is what it means. So a lot of research has shown that mental health can be uh, seen as a one-factor model, unidimensional made up of all of the items. We're going to test that. It can also be seen as a three-first-order factor model that's correlated with one another. It can also be seen as a higher order factor where emotional well-being, psychological well-being, and social well-being make up mental health. Or it can be seen as a bifactor model where mental health is measured um, and then um, when we're controlling for the presence of mental health, there is three other factors, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So these are the normal CFA models. Because there's strong relations between the factors, right? We can assume them and we see them because they're estimated as such. We can then, of course, do more complex analysis in ESIM. So we can then, because they're relationship between these factors, a theoretical argument why, we can estimate an ESIM model with three first order factors. So a three first order correlated ESIM model. 
We can also then correlate the or create a higher order fractal model just like this one, but based on ESIM. But then we utilize the ESIM within CFA framework to specify this because we can't specify higher order factor just by these factors. And we can estimate a by factor ESIM model. So these are the seven models that we are going to test. Now, I assume that if you are interested in um, ESIM, that you know how to estimate these models, at least normal models in uh, MPLAS, so moral confirmatory factor analysis models. So I'm not going to ru run all of these now in uh, just to save some time, but this is how you would specify one factor model, mental health by all of the items, um, emotional, psychological, and social well-being by these items as a three factor model. Um, the higher order factor model is mental health is then made up of these three factors, which is the combination of these items and our by factor model, which I think you might not be so familiar with. Um, where we specify a general factor, which is made up of all of the items um, of mental health, but we free the parameter and we also specify the three specific factors, emotional, psychological, social well-being, just like we would do here. But we free the first parameter because remember in a normal um, a normal measurement model, these first items are usually constrained to one to help with estimation. But in a bifactor model, we allow all of these things to be estimated freely. You can either, um, we then also constrain because each one of these factors are then independent, right? They're, they're made up of some of the same items, but they are different from one another. So we just constrain all of these factor variances to one, like we would normally do. So this is then each one has its own variance of one. And then we constrain all of these factor variances to um, uh, all of these factors to not relate to each other. You can do this in two ways. You can either just put in rotation, target orthogonal, then all of these factors would automatically not be related, or you can specify it manually. Now, I like to do it manually because I want to know what's going on in my data um, or in my analysis. I don't like these commands that much. Um, but you can do it either way, either include this or that, but even including that will not help. Now, unfortunately, in my case, there was a, um, a negative residual variance on uh, when I specified the bifactor model for this item and Klein indicates that you should constrain that item then to be the residual variance to be just larger than one because a negative residual variance is impossible. You can't have a negative residual variance. So I just constrained this to 0 0.3 to uh, and help with convergence. So I've done this now and this is my CFA results. What do you guys see? Does the data fit the model? First order, unidimensional? Nope, 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 nope. Nope. Third, three factor model? Nope, nope. Second order factor, they should show exactly the same um, results here because there's only three factors, so nope. And the bi factor model comes close, yet the TLI is not significant. So only the CFI works. TLI doesn't meet criteria, RMC doesn't meet criteria, only SRMR does. So, Ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. We have a big problem. And the problem is that none of the traditional CFI models fit our data. So what would we do? We would then go back and we would go modify factors and remove items and correlate error terms, all of these dubious tactics that I know you guys like, you would go do to try and force fit. But unfortunately, that is nicht gut, as I would say in German. So um, we have to look at other ways. Enter exploratory structure equation modeling. So, look at this handsome fellow. This is Leon de Beer, the most handsomest man I know, the smartest guy that I know. So we then went and we created a tool to help you guys um, estimate your own eSIM model. So you can go and go to this link, right? Surveyhost.co.za forward slash eSIM. And you will get taken to um, this page where we can start your eSIM journey. So. Let's see how this tool works. I'm going to close the presentation now and I've already opened it here. So when you go to survey host, oh, sorry. When you go to the, the website, you'll be confronted with this thing, right? And what you insert here, we also have an explanation here and explanation here if you need more detail. But what you want, what you want you to do here is just to specify your normal first order factor model, right? Nothing fancy, just like you would have done in 
um, sorry, just like you would have done in your normal CFA uh, model, you go and you put in, just like you would normally do, emotional well-being is made up of item one, two, and three, social well-being item four, five, six, seven, eight, psychological well-being nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So we just specify our normal CFI model here. Then we click continue. And that's where the magic happens. So now, as you can clearly see, um, it shows us what our original input is. If you click here, right? Um, it also generates, wow, look at that. It also generates the regular eSIM um, syntax that you need to run an eSIM model based on that model. So you don't have to do all of these things manually. Perfect, and I'll explain this in a moment uh, when we do it practically. It also does automatically for you the bifactor factor model, where it helps you to constrain the, the right factors over it, et cetera. So you can just go, copy and paste this entire thing into M plus um, and indicate what your data is, right? Um, what your variables are in your data set, what your missing values are, um, and then you can just run it. It's as easy as that. So I'm going to first start and copy all of this. Oopsie daisy. I'm going to copy all of this. And I have already indicated it in my data set. So I've pasted it in here already for us. So what I've done is I have inputted where my data is. This is my data file. It's called mplus.txt. <clears throat> These are all of the factors in my data set or all the, the variables in my data set. These are the variables that I'm going to use. I just specify them uh, because they're, they come, they get taken from your uh, instructions, right? So they're taken here. And then you get a nice explanation of the things that you need. So for example, like I've mentioned before, you have to indicate what your estimation method is. So usually um, we use ML, right? But if your thing is not, uh, if there's issues with your data, or if it's not normally distributed, use MLR. If it's categorical, we use the categorical uh, indicator. Processors is just indicating how many processors you want to use for your analysis. Usually more complex ones requires more, if you have more. Um, yeah, so if you have convergence issues in your data, um, especially with more complex models, um, you just change the starting values to whatever arbitrary number you have and you change the S iterations. This helps us to kind of figure out what the most optimal starting values are for your solution. Um, in this case, we just use a normal target rotation because it's just a normal ESIM. But if we wanted to use um, exploratory thing, we could use um, Geoman. Or if you wanted to do by factor, we can use uh, um, orthogonal. I can't say that word, Ortho orthogonal, right? Um, here, we then specify it generates the code for you for each one of these things. So it's important to note that um, emotional well-being is then targeted, is targeted to be measured by these three items because this is what it's theoretically measured to do. And the little dash with zero indicates that um, the non-intended cross-loadings are constrained to be as close to zero to pos as possible. So for all of these factors, for these items then on this um, factor, so from four to 14, we allow for cross-loadings, which is this thing, right? But we want to constrain it to be as close to zero to possible, okay? And then we also, because we have to have like convergence here, we have to indicate that um, this whole model here is exploratory, it's part of the exploratory model. And we do this by adding this thing. We do the same here. So social well-being, as you can remember, is made up of items four to eight, and this is just the cross-loadings. Nine to 14, cross-loadings. We just indicate, um, we want to standardize results, and we run. Now, it's important to note we have to run this because we want to utilize this output in a moment to help us generate the higher order factor and the ESIM within CFA thing, for example. So we generate it. We look for an error. Thank goodness, no error. Here, they just indicate what our sample size is. Um, we look at our model fit. Does it fit? Not significant, unfortunately. It is uh, barely meeting the Remisa criteria, but it is not significant. Um, our CFI and TLI is acceptable. Our SRMR is acceptable. So we are good to go. So we then go to our standardized residuals and we see that the items 
that are supposed to load on the factor, so the target items, they load high, as they're supposed to do, and significant, and there are cross-loadings. And there's maybe an item here, number 11, that might be a little bit big, but this is not, this is not an issue. So the cross-loadings, because we want it, is not an issue, and the, if they load significant or not, it's also not an issue, but we want to allow for it. The same with social well-being, we see that the four items, four to eight, um, is significant, they load high, there might be a little bit of an issue with um, number five, but it's still acceptable, um, and all of the other factors have small to medium loadings, which is perfect, and the same with psychological well-being. Okay, the factual correlations are 0 0.3, 0 0.58, and 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.64. So that's also okay. So we know that these things are related, theoretically. Residual variances are acceptable. And yeah, so great. We, have, we ran our first essay model. Congratulations, you have it. Okay, now let's do more complex stuff. So um, I've already copied and pasted the uh, bifactor thing. So first I'm going to run the bifactor. So in the bifactor thing, all that I do is now is I change the rotation to orthogonal. I think it already does that. Yes, it does. And this is then just a normal bifactor uh, estimation, but we then again um, allow for these uh, we indicate that this part is exploratory. We constrain the factors, the cross loadings to be close to zero as possible, as normal, and we click run. Okay, is there an error? Whew. Gosh, I hate them errors. Nope. So now we can see, clearly see, that, wait, this is the other one, that our by factor model fits the data better than our three factor model. So we see, Lower chi-square, uh, oh, non-significant RMC, uh, big CLI, TLI, bigger than that, lower SRMR, lower remisa, lower chi-square, lower everything. So actually, a bar factor model works amazing. Uh, I know we'll compare all of these things later. Okay, so bar factor, what's important for us in our bar factor model is that our general factor is relatively well-defined. As you can see here, very large loadings on it. Um, our target loadings are still significant for each one of these factors. And yeah, number five is a little bit of an issue. And uh, yeah, there is an issue with the psychological well-being one, which, which I'll show you guys in a moment for the bifactor model. Um, so psychological well-being or the general factor of mental health seems to capture more of the psychological well-being components, right? So it explains more than... Um, psychological well-being. So each of these items that do not load significantly here, so 11, uh, 13, and 14, these things are stronger indicators or only indicate general mental health and not so much psychological well-being when we control for mental health. Okay. Um, important to check, just make sure that all of these things are always zero and variances are one because that's how we constrain it. And that's it. You got your bifactor model. Perfect. But now you want to do more complex analysis. So you want to do, use your, let's say, let's just for argument's sake, say that the three factor model fitted the data the best and we did not test the bifactor. Just imagine with me. So we want to use this three factor model now and one create a higher order factor to see if that works, right? Or we want to use this three factor model now in more complex analysis, like in a structural model to kind of see if mental illness predicts mental health, for example, or the three components. So what we have to do is, we do not refresh this page, we need all of the information that we previously inputted, but what we want to do is we want to upload the output of this ESM model, the regular ESM model. So we click upload, I go to my desktop, uh, ESM, and I go to my output file, which is this one, and I upload it. Three factor model upload. So we've got two default loadings is what I would suggest um, because what we basically do is we take all of the standard, unstandardized factor loadings from the ESM model and we use that to re-specify it as a, a CFA model, right? So we use those unstandardized values now as um, starting values for our new re-specified CFA model. 
the optimized um, one is we're trying to look for the most optimal solution in there. So I would for now just click on the default values. So I click continue. Now you'll see two extra things. Firstly, a high RQL eSIM model and then an eSIM within CFA. So a high RQL one is the model where we have uh, is, uh, wait, the high RQL one is this model, this model. Right. So what we've done here is um, we've taken the. Uh, let me see if I can open this quickly. If you take the, if you open the uh, original CFA um, uh, output, then you'll see for emotional well-being the target factor we've constrained to zero point nine three four, which is this value. You see, for mental health zero point nine oh seven, that value. So we've constrained all of these item loadings, right, to start to be the same as this values from our ESM model. So now we've got a perfect ESM within CFA model, right? Um, I'm going to, then you basically just copy and paste this um, full syntax. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to say. Um, we then also kind of have to free because this is a, um, a normal uh, CFA thing now, we have to free each one of the different factors to be freely estimated and then we constrain the overall factor loading of the higher factor to one, right? Like we would normally do in a normal CFA, okay? Because up until this point, up until this point, it is a um, normal, uh, like an ESM within CFA thing and this is now just a standard, slightly modified um, CFA factor. So I copy and paste all of this Bum, bum. and I run it in my model. Okay, so I've added this now. I've just cleaned it up a little bit to make it easier for you guys. I click run and we see no errors, thank goodness. We check, ah, so there's our first issue. You see our TLI is lower, or our CFI is higher, non-significant. So our bifactor model, if you can remember correctly, Still fits the data best. Anyway, um, so all of these factors should kind of relatively be um, the same. What's important here for us is to look at this. So here is now where we, is, where we specify the higher order factor model. So here, each one of these factors need to be significant and large contributors to well-being. So uh, mental health by emotion, psychological, whatever, and these are the factor loadings from the first order factor to the higher order factor model. Okay, so pretty much exactly the same. The only thing that's extra interesting for us here is that now we also have the amount of variance that each one um, contributes. So emotional well-being, 20%, 31%, and 32%. Okay, so that's our higher order factor model. But unfortunately, we're not going to retain this one because it is crappy. Okay, so um, now what we want to do is we go back to our um, to our analyses and we go and we tabulate all of the CFA and there we go. So we tabulate all of the CFA and ESM stuff into one table and then we look and we compare, right? So we know none of these factors fit the data. Maybe the bifactor model here, maybe if we made modifications. But now we can kind of see all of our bifactor, uh, all of our ESM models seems to fit the data better than the CFI models, right? So none meet the criteria, that one partially, actually only the one criteria, two criteria. Here, all of them excluding the high order factor fits the data. Um, just ignore the, the ESM within CFA thing. Um, I estimated this just to show that um, it should produce exactly the same model fit statistics as your three factor because you're re-specifying this now, that model as a CFA, ESM within CFI model. So it should be exactly, exactly the same, right? Although your standardized errors might be a little bit inflated for this model, but uh, the model fit stuff and parameter estimate should be exactly the same. So what do we see? You're right. Out of all of this, we can see that the bifactor ESM model is the model that we have to retain for further analysis. So after all of the steps, the bifactor ESM model is the best one for our data. And that's how this pretty beast looks like. This model made up of these items, 
These are the cross loadings and this is what it looks like. So we then go and we look at the parameter estimate so we can clearly see that it's a very relatively well-defined um, general factor. Each, at least for the emotional well-being and social well-being components, they are significant. We're more interested here about um, the patterns so they should load how they're supposed to load rather than the significance levels and etc. But at least here they do measure significantly. The only problem is on psychological well-being. So here we see that only item 9, 10 and 12 measures psychological well-being, right? Um, where it seems that these items 11, 13 and 14, which load on, which, is a, which are components of psychological well-being, is a stronger indicator of overall mental health. So in the presence of these factors, right, um, in the presence of overall mental health, if we consider that, if we control for it, these three items, I can't remember what they are now, um, these three items do not indicate psychological well-being anymore. And that's an important, uh, an, an important finding. Okay, so up until now, you've done great. Thank you guys for being with me. The last part is that but we don't want to stop here. We want to. I will, we also want to do more complex analysis. So um, I want to demonstrate this one last thing about the ECM within CFA stuff. So like I've imagined, said, let's just imagine for a moment that the three factor, the three correlated factorial model. I just took out the correlation stripes here just to make the picture look a little bit neater. Um, but we want to see if these three factors predict or well, if mental illness predicts or is associated with these three factors. So what's the relation between mental illness, emotional well-being, psychological well-being, and social well-being, right? We can't use this model because it will not converge. So we have to create this. We have to make this an E7 within CFA model. Okay. So what I then did was you just go and you copy and paste this entire thing, right, into your syntax. So I've already done that um, and I've just changed what I needed to change. Data file, uh, here are all of my factors. So in this data set we also have the basic symptoms inventory, so the normed factor scores for each one of them. Right? And I'm going to use all of these factors, so somatic stuff, cognitive impairment, depression, fear, phobia, whatever, psychosis. So I'm taking all of these factors, the normed factor scores, and I'm going to create a normal first order factor model CFA. So say total pathology, total mental illness by all of these items, right? Here is my ESEM within CFA model because now each one of these factors are kind of constrained or the ESEM models was re-estimated as a CFA model. And now that this is done, so from here, I'm just going to say normal, CFA, normal CFA. From here on, you can do any type of analysis that you would normally do. You want to do invariance testing, you want to do whatever, you want to do latent growth, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. So from this point onwards, you can use emotion, social well-being, psychological well-being as independent factors like you would normally do in any normal analysis. So what I'm just doing now is to say emotional well-being, social well-being, and um, psychological well-being is regressed on mental illness. I'm running it. This just says that that sentence is longer than eight, so don't worry about that. Not an issue. No other issues. Does the data fit my model? Yes, it does. Uh, model's more complex, so it's okay. Still meets the criteria. Still meets the criteria. Uh, let's just go to the standardized results. Um, factors load how they're supposed to load. Still the same. outfits. All of these factors load the same. Now it's interesting. So now we can kind of see uh, the regression. So our diagram, I always just check the diagram to make sure that everything is correct. So here we see mental illness predicts these things or is associated with these things. So here we see that um, when a person experiences or reports high levels of mental illness, they're going to show lower, they're going to report lower levels of emotional well-being. If they report higher levels of mental illness, they're going to show lower levels of social well-being and if they report higher levels of um, 
mental illness, they're going to show lower levels of psychological well-being. Pretty straightforward, right? So now we've got an ESA model within CFA and we can do a normal structural model and port it like we would do normally. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, from uh, that perspective, thank you guys so much. I really hope you guys learned something. And if you've got any questions around anything else, you know where, um, where to find me. Um, just one last thing, though, that there are three very important references though that I think you guys can um, read for more information. So of course, if you use our tool, please, please, please reference us. It will mean the world to us um, because this will also show us if the things that we're making is meaningful and valuable to you. If not, we won't create more tools. So please cite this. And also for more details and guidelines, so best practice guidelines on how to report, how to approach it, and a more technical explanation of the tool, please go to our, um, our paper. So it should be published by the time you see this, otherwise just Google it and it will come up on ResearchGate. And this is a really important chapter from Morin and Marsh that really explains things in a very simplistic manner for you guys. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, from my side and from Leon, T-Rex the beer, I am saying goodbye.